inflation remains near a record high and it shows no signs of slowing. The consumer price You're index for September was up 8.2 percent compared to a year ago. Has made landfall as a category four winds of 155 miles per tensions between the West and Russia. Russian nuclear-capable warplanes were spotted in the Pacific. If you don't have your wallet, there's no problem. Just scan your palm to pay. Amazon One is a payment system that has been tested at several Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 14, and a little bit in Revelation um, chapter 16 um, this evening. So we're back in our Clues and Milestones um, sermon series. We're looking at um, clues, you know, things that the Bible tells us that will happen um, in the end times. We know that, again, we know that even Jesus said that after his coming that we're already in the last days. The, the disciples were in the last days, meaning um, the last half of whatever you know, time the earth is going to be in is after Jesus came. Um, so we're in the last days, but when are the end times? So the end times, we get several um, things that are supposed to happen. We've looked at a few of those things already. Um, a lot of those things are clues. Um, a lot of those things, like we talked about um, last time, the abomination of desolation, those are definite milestones, things that we're going to be like, oh yeah, that, that's what that is. You're not going to miss those things. Um, those are going to be definite things that stand out where you can just point to that part in the Bible and say, that's what that is. All right. Tonight we're going to talk about um, another clue. And you could call it a milestone, but I don't believe um, it will ever get completely realized. And what I want to talk about this evening um, is going to be very similar to the very first um, sermon in this series. What I want to talk about this evening is the cashless society or the cashless um, global financial system um, that everyone talks about with end times. And the funny thing um, about the cashless society that you hear about when people talk about end times prophecy is that, you know, the Bible never really says that. The Bible never really says that, oh, there's not going to be any cash. You know, there's not going to be any currency that you can use, like physical, you know, bills that you can spend um, out there. Um, but it's kind of like the one world government where it's, it's kind of implied, it's inferred from some of the things that happen, mainly in Revelation chapter 13. So let's try to understand um, this clue, why people talk about a cashless society. I do believe that this will be a clue, even though it's not mentioned in the Bible that we'll have a cashless society or a cashless um, financial um, system. I do believe that things will move that way. I believe it's a clue because I don't know that it will ever be completely realized. I'll talk about that um, a little bit later on in the sermon. But it's a clue. It's a clue that it's something that we should be watching for. So you say, it's not in the Bible, <clears throat> pastor, so where does this come from? All right, where does this come from? It comes from Revelation chapter 13, mainly starting in verse number 16. It comes to understand the cashless society and why people think that there will be a cashless society in the end times um, when the Antichrist is on the scene. We first need to understand a few things, and the first thing that we need to look at is the mark of the beast itself. All right, what is the mark of the beast? Look down at Revelation chapter 13 and look at verse number 16. So now, right after this or right around this same time is the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist has already, you know, he's declared himself God. He set up some image in the temple. He's stopped the sacrifice and he has declared that people worship this image in the temple. That's the abomination of desolation. I encourage you to check out um, that sermon if you haven't heard that one. But in Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 16, right after this, we see this. It says, and after this, so he says that, you know, in verse 15, if they don't worship, he sets up this image, and if they don't worship the image of the beast, they should be killed, all right? So there's this command that people need to worship this image that he sets up in the temple, but then there's something additional that he does in verse number 16. And it says, and, meaning in addition to, also he's going to do this. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark 
in their right hand or in their foreheads. Look at verse number 17. Why? Why do that? And he explains in verse 17 the purpose of this mark in verse 17. It says, and that no man might buy or sell save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And I'll get into that here in just a few uh, minutes. But the basic idea is that the Antichrist, after he sets up this image and demands that people worship it, he's going to have people take this mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And I've already talked about that in the past. Why? Why the forehead? Because the Antichrist, Satan always copies God. And whenever God seals somebody in the Bible, he seals them in their forehead, just like he seals the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14. Where does he seal them? He seals them in their foreheads. All right, so Satan never comes up with anything original, folks. He's always copying God. But in this case, he, he, he causes them, everybody, to take this mark in their forehead and in their right hand. Why? So you can't buy or sell. So it's tied, it's tied to the economic ability to purchase things, to sell things, to make money, and to get goods, to basically participate in the economy of the beast, of the Antichrist, you will need to have this mark and worship this image, all right? So how does that relate to a cashless society? First of all, regarding the mark of the beast, you know, these, this is also something that we can be looking for, we can watch for. You know, this technology exists today. And it didn't exist 40 years ago. It didn't exist 30 years ago. There's many people today, uh, mainly when I looked up the, the statistics on this, mainly there's, I think the country that's the most into it right now is Sweden, but there's literally thousands of people in Sweden that are putting a small RFID chip in their hand. They're putting this chip in their hand that contains things like, you know, their financial information, their bank accounts, um, locks to doors to their apartments, to their houses, you know, health information, social media account and contacts are on this chip that these Swedes are putting um, in their hand. As a matter of fact, the company, um, when I was reading about this um, just a little while ago, the company that is providing these RFID chips is their, their backlog. They can't, they can't keep up with the demand enough, all right? So it's a real thing. The technology has been a lot, has been around for, I remember I was in the semiconductor industry about, I started in the semiconductor industry about 22 years ago, and this technology was just taking off at that time, this RFID technology. The way it works is you don't even have to have a battery. It's a tiny little simple circuit that just contains um, information, you know, digital information about you, whether it's your bank accounts, credit cards, whatever, and it's just, it's stored in this tiny little chip and there's no battery, it doesn't need to be powered. It's actually powered by radio waves from a transmitter and a receiver that kind of powers up this device and sends the information back to um, the receiver that sent the waves in the first place. It's kind of a neat um, technology. It's used to track packages for, for Amazon and all these different um, companies that send packages around the world. But the technology is there. All that to say this. You know, the Swedes that are doing this in Sweden, they're not taking the mark of the beast, okay? It's just, it's, these things are clues that we need to watch for. It's the technologies there for Revelation chapter 13, verse number 16 and 17 to be actually realized. So that technology is there. I mean, look, it, if it was 40 years ago, you're just like, what does that even mean? How could you even control somebody's ability to buy or sell by them putting something in their hand? That doesn't even make any sense. Well, it makes perfect sense now. Because if you have everything in a chip that is, is digitally, you know, controlled and connected to an account of some kind, you know, on the web, um, on the Internet of Things, whatever you want to call it, um, out there, it can definitely be shut off. You know, these accounts can be closed. These things can be um, stopped. You can be sanctioned um, this way. All right. So we see the technology for this is it's possible uh, today. All right. It's possible today. You know, Amazon won. Amazon One. Amazon is coming out um, with a, I, I think it's out actually. I think it's usable. It doesn't use a chip. It doesn't use um, anything that you actually put into your hand or into your forehead, but it just reads, you know, everyone has a unique palm ID and it just reads, it has a palm reader, literally, that 
you have all your information on your Amazon account and they, it's how do I know it's you? You just put your palm over this thing and bam, it just scans your palm, it knows it's you and there's all your account information. That's payment, account info, orders, all those different um, things. All right, um, interesting thing about the mark of the beast, um, the Bible specifically says that it's in your right hand and your forehead. I explained why I believe that it's in the forehead because Satan copies God, but why the right hand? Um, I've preached this before, but here's the thing. I think this is pretty simple, and I've even done a test on the church on this idea. But first of all, 90% of people are right-handed. 90% of people out there are right-handed, meaning if they're going to build infrastructure that's going to read some, something from a hand, it's going to be built for the majority of the people for the right hand. All right? So I believe that 90% of the people are right-handed is why this is. And here's what's interesting. We had a church function about two and a half years ago, and 90% of the people are right-handed. And there was a church function that we went to where a bracelet, an armband, a little bracelet had to be put on um, to the person to play a certain activity um, at this church function. And I told the lady that I, I purchased all the, you know, all the tickets for everybody. And I told the lady, I said, when the church people come up, it's like, don't tell them what hand. To, to give. Don't tell them what hand to put forward. Just hold out the bracelet and see what hand they give you. 100% of the church gave the right hand. <laughs> so, I mean, it shows you that, you know, the right hand is just kind of that, that instant reaction for people. And not everybody in the church was right-handed. So, it, anyway, it was just a little um, test. That's why I believe it's the right hand, if you've ever wondered um, about that. But the point is, it's going to be used, it, the technology is there for the mark of the beast, and it's going to be used to economically sanction people, all right, to economically shut off the people that don't get the mark and don't worship the beast himself, all right. Now, what you say, what about the number of his name? What about the number of his name? A lot is made about, you know, the number of the beast, 666, right? You know, the, the number of, of Satan and the beast. So, Turn to Revelation, or look down at Revelation chapter 13, and look down at verse number 17 real quickly. And let's just look at this just for a couple minutes, the number of the beast. I don't think this one is that important, and I'll tell you why. But look at verse 17. It says that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And then the Bible actually gives you what the number is. Okay, look at the next verse. It says, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. So scores. Scores are 20, okay? So it's six hundred, three score, three times 20 is 60, and then six. That's why the number of the beast is six, 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 six hundred and sixty, six. All right? Now, it says, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. So who who has understanding? Who has understanding in the Bible? We just talked about it this morning. The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. Wisdom comes from wisdom and understanding comes from the Word of God. So this implies that the people who know the Lord, the saved, will understand how to count the, the, the beast's number, all right? The Antichrist number. You say, so basically, they'll be able to figure out the, you know, that his number is 666. That's what the Bible is implying here. Now, people really run with this one, all right? People really run with this one, and I don't think it's that important because by this time, think about the, what do we learn about, what's the whole point of this series? There's a timeline, and then there's specific events that need to happen. So, by this time, when people are taking the mark of the beast and, and he's demanding that they take it and worship his image, what has already happened? What has already happened is the abomination of desolation has happened and the image is already set up in the temple where the Antichrist is demanding that people worship him. We already know who he is at that point. All right, The number, being able to count and figure out the number of the beast is just kind of like, Oh, yeah, and it's just going to be that fulfilled prophecy as well. And the same people will be able to figure that out somehow, the Bible says. Now, people really run with this one because basically every world leader from Nero to Stalin to Hitler to Ronald Reagan has been declared the Antichrist with this criteria. You know, they, 
they do all kinds of number tricks and assign a number to a letter and all these different things. Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan's, uh, his, his, his middle name was Ronald Wilson Reagan, right? And if you look at Ronald Wilson Reagan, each of those names has six letters in it. Six, six, six. This is what people said in the 80s, right? People that didn't, they, of course, these weren't like fans of Ronald Reagan, right? So these were people that didn't like Ronald Reagan, and they're like, ah, he's Satan. He's the, he's the Antichrist, right? So we're not to take this football and just run with it like people do with a lot of these different clues, because obviously with the timeline of the Bible, by the time the number of the beast is able to be counted by the saved, we'll already know who he is anyway according to what Revelation chapter 13 is telling us. All right? Now, all that to be said, back to the cashless society. What does this have to do with a cashless society? Well, obviously, the mark of the beast is used to economically control people. It is used to, you know, control people to, you know, they can't buy anything and they can't sell anything. All right? So cash today... You know, governments typically don't like people using cash. Why? Because it can't be tracked. You know, nobody wants, nobody in the, in the U.S. federal government wants somebody working for cash. You know, that's what they call like working under the table, right? The government doesn't want people working for cash. They don't want you hiring somebody at your house and then paying them with 20s, you know, under the table. Because it can't be tracked. It can't be taxed. Ultimately, you know, they can't tax that type of money. So how are they going to abolish this? You know, what grounds will they abolish the use of cash? Because they have to be able, in order to say you can't buy or sell, they have to squash this to a major degree. This ability to transact under the table, so to speak, right? This is where people get the idea that there will be a cashless society, all right, is that in order to prevent people from buying and selling, you just can't have cash. Because otherwise, you know, you and your buddies and all these, you know, all these Christians and their buddies could just be doing transactions and the government, you know, wouldn't even know about it. This government of the beast wouldn't have any idea, any way to control it. All right. So how will it be abolished is what we want to look at this evening. We're already seeing these clues, all right, which is why I think this is such an important thing to look at because Many of these clues on the direction and heading towards a cashless society, towards a digital economy, so to speak, we're seeing a lot of these clues already, all right? Now, why will it be, why will it be accepted? Why will people say, no, I don't want to use cash anymore? The first one is this, it's easier. It's easier. That's why the Swedes are doing what they're doing. That's why if you interview and go and, and there's lots of articles written about, you know, people that are taking this little chip um, in their thumb in Sweden. And it's just, why, why are they doing it? Because it's just, it makes life so much easier. That's what they say. They're not religious people. They don't care what the Bible says. They don't know what the Bible says. They're just, hey, it's just, it's just easier. It's easier to, when I walk to my apartment, instead of getting out my keys and trying to fumble for my keys and losing my keys and I can't find them, it's easier just to be bloop, and just unlock the door. It's easier to, instead of like having credit cards and fumbling through credit cards that can be lost or stolen or whatever. I mean, think about it. I mean, somebody uh, grabs your mail and they grab a, I don't know, we, it's just, I don't know, it's amazing how many credit card applications you get in the mail these days. You know, somebody just knows a little bit of information about you, they could, you know, get that credit card and I suppose start spending money on it. But the point is that instead of fumbling for having all these cards, these different accounts, just bloop, just pay for things that way. It's much easier, all right? But here's the thing. I'm going to make you feel a little bit better um, tonight because I believe that this idea, this transition towards a cashless society and towards a complete digital economy I believe that this kind of is a major clue that tells us that, you know, the end times, it, it's, it's a clue that points us to some evidence that the end times is maybe a little further away than maybe in our lifetimes. And look, things can change in a hurry. I get that. All right. But this is one clue that shows you that a lot of things still need to happen. All right. Remember I talked about India and China. Why do I talk about India and China so much? Because half the world lives there. Half the world lives in India and China. What do you need? 
What do you need access to to be able to have all your money and all your accounts digital and in a chip in your hand? What do you need access to? You need access to the internet. 30% of people in China and over 50% of people in India don't have access to the internet. So that needs to be solved. That needs to, you know, be fixed or remedied. These people, you know, we're talking about a billion and a half people that I just mentioned. A billion and a half people are transacting um, using bills, using cash. They're probably trading or bartering for things. Who knows? Or, you know, just trading labor or whatever they're doing. But to modernize a society beyond the point of cash, everybody needs the internet. And look, you need massive infrastructure to move a billion and a half people online. All right, so those are things that need to happen. So remember the methodology of the sermon series. We look at what the Bible says, and we just walk it back to what we're seeing today. Where, where, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that, you know, he's going to be able to control buying and selling. What do we have to have happen from what we see today to get to that point? Well, we need a lot of infrastructure. We need a lot of people to get online that today just don't have that infrastructure or that ability to do so. All right? So that may, might get to go soul winning for a couple more weeks. All right? So here's another reason. What's another reason that they will use to get rid of cash? All right? Here's another one. Safety and security. Safety and security. So first of all, I never carry cash. And this is one of the reasons. <laughs> if somebody comes up to me and asks me for money, like, you know, just like just some, some bum asking me for money, I literally say, and I can say this truthfully, I don't have any cash because I don't have cash. I don't carry cash around. If I have to pay the kid's allowance or something like that, um, I have to, you know, steal it from my wife or something. You know, I, I don't have cash with me, right? Or go to an ATM or whatever. Here's another one. Here's another way they'll get rid of cash. Health. Health. Health is a huge lever that they're going to be pulling on people to get control. There's been, there's one of the most disgusting things that you have in your pocket is the, is the money that you carry around. The money, by the way, and your phone. <laughs> I'm not a germaphobe, but they've done studies on the things that are on your phone. You should wash your phone and disinfect your phone. They're like, most phones are more dirty than a toilet, than a toilet seat. You're like, ugh, it's in your pocket. You put it on your face. <laughs> I mean, it's, I'm not a germaphobe, but your phone is very dirty. And guess what? Cash is very, very dirty. Cash is dirty. They've done... They've, they've grabbed like $20 bills and some of the higher circulated bills, like $5 and $20, and they've done tests on these bills. Like 90% of, it's like 80%. 80% of cash that they do tests on has traces of cocaine, drugs on it. And you think about things like fentanyl that are going around and these like extremely powerful chemicals that can really harm you. And look, I'm not a germaphobe, but I don't like touching cash. You know, after you touch cash, you should wash your hands. If you're at a Subway or a sandwich shop and they, they, they're counting change for the customer in front of you, and then they go and make your sandwich without gloves on, you should not go to that sandwich shop, all right? <laughs> because cash is like, there's all kinds of, I won't even list all the things that are all over cash. You can about imagine, all right? You can about imagine. But I'm not a germaphobe and I don't like touching because it's extremely dirty. So that's one of the reasons that they'll use, especially in this era, this era of COVID and bacteria and everybody's, you know, we were at the donut shop today and I mean, I don't, it, people's paranoia doesn't even make sense anymore, but it's there. We're at the donut shop and there's this lady getting donuts and she didn't have a mask on or anything and she's getting donuts and she's in the shop and, and she gets out of the, the donut shop and she gets in her car by herself and puts her mask on. And I'm just like, what is happening here? You know, so people are paranoid. They're, they're just, they're paranoid about health. This is, will be one of the reasons that we use or that the governments use to get rid of cash. All right. And then, you know, of course, fraud. I've already kind of mentioned that one. And another one, I actually looked up on some um, financial websites. The central banks are saying that cash, the central banks of Europe and the United States have been pushing this agenda to get rid of cash for a long time now. All right, they've been trying to get digital currencies created and just get rid of cash all in general. And the two reasons that they give are fraud, number one, and terrorism. 
you know, because it's used by terrorists, right? That's like every government's favorite scapegoat. It's like, oh, we have to do this because of the terrorists. Don't get me started, right? We have to go and invade all these people because of the terrorists. He's going to get you otherwise, right? So terrorism and fraud is being already being used by the central banks to try to get rid of cash. And they're trying to get to digital currencies. I'm not talking, and by the way, I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm talking about just their own digital currencies, like a digital dollar, right? Bitcoin is, don't even get me started on, on Bitcoin, but Bitcoin actually has to go away or be minimalized by, because it, it literally can't be controlled. It's not owned by any government. It's not controlled by anybody. It's just there. It can't be regulated. It can't be banned. It, it's just, it's just, it's there. It's, it's a thing all on, it's just a piece of computer code that's just living on its own. And as long as people are running that code, it, it can't be, I mean, that's actually against, you know, this control. It would actually go against this control. So they need to, you know, try to put that away. So instead, central banks are now trying to create digital currencies. You're already seeing this now. You're already seeing this now. They're talking about it in the United States. They're talking about it in Europe. But again, a lot of people need the internet in order to use this type of currency, even if they do move down this road um, soon. All right, so look, this is where the idea of a cashless society comes from. But there's major things that need to happen before that, you know, that is kind of one of the things that tells me that maybe the end times, maybe the Antichrist is not going to happen in my lifetime. Of course, any emergency, any war could change things very quickly. I get that. But let me give you two alternative thoughts because everybody just kind of assumes. Everybody just kind of assumes that because of the mark of the beast and what Revelation chapter 13 says, that it's just going to be a cashless society, all right? It's going to be a cashless society, and that's it, all right? But, and if that's the case, the end times is not soon, okay? But let me give you two alternative thoughts on how this control could be achieved without society getting completely cashless, all right? Now, you're going to go to back to verse number 16 and verse number 17 of Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to give you two just competing theories um, uh, that I've thought about that could be possible. All right? I don't know. This is just um, a possibility. All right? The, remember, the Bible doesn't say a cashless society. People just assume that because they assume that the government of the Antichrist will be able to control buying and selling. All right? So... Go back to verse number 16 and verse number 17. Let's read those again. Let's read those again. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So that implies control. Okay? That implies control, that you can't buy or sell. All right? It doesn't imply digital control. You say, what, what do I mean by that? The one thing that I keep bringing up India and China, one thing that India and China have that we don't have is manpower, is the ability to control through not digital means, but to control through manpower. If you look at, it's happening again in China, by the way with the COVID stuff. If you look at what happened during COVID, especially in China, they, they had some serious control over their people. You say, how did they do it? Did they digitally lock it? No, they just have a lot of people. They have millions and millions of soldiers. They have millions and millions of government people that can be used to control people. You know, there was a lot of talk in 2019 going into 2020 that the United States during COVID was going to, oh, they're going to, they might declare martial law. And I kind of rolled my eyes about that because Americans just kind of generally don't like being controlled. They don't like being controlled. I remember during COVID, we kind of had our, our lives didn't really change that much. We were still doing church and we were still coming to church, still doing what we do there. And then my family and I, we kind of had a route of places that we knew, you know, that restaurants that didn't close and, you know, places that you could still go shopping and things like that. And it didn't really change our lives in there. And they were always talking about, oh, they're going to declare martial law and no one's going to be able to leave their house in the United States. I'm like, they're going to have to roll the military in here to get that to happen. And if the United States would have rolled the military in in 2020, 
that would have caused another whole slew of problems in the United States. I, I, I don't believe that they were even thinking about that. But look, because people wouldn't have listened, all right? But what countries like India and China have is manpower, and that's what they use to lock down their countries, is just brute force with people, all right? Now go back to Revelation chapter 13. So it might not be digital control. It might just be overbearing manpower that fills in the gaps where, you know, societies haven't gone completely cashless, where they just throw a bunch of, you know, government agents and soldiers and all these things to just make sure they're trying to, they, they control that buying and selling. All right? I mean, it's not a pleasant thing to think about, but it's a possibility. All right? It's a possibility. That's what we're doing. We're just looking at clues and thinking about how can we possibly get there from here. Here's the second thought. So the first thought is that maybe it's not all digital control. Maybe there's going to be some cash that remains, and they're just going to control that through manpower, through overbearing police state type stuff, government control. We see that happen today. I mean, when countries like China can say, you people in this apartment complex can't leave, you know, because we say. <laughs> I mean, I guess there's protests going on right now because they locked down an apartment complex and there was a fire and a bunch of people died. But they successfully kept them in the apartment complex through manpower, through an overbearing police state. All right, so that's possible. That's one, it's another way to control people other than just flipping a digital switch and shutting off people's accounts, all right? So it might not be completely cashless. Here's the second thought. Go back to verse 17. Here's the second thought. Here's the second thought. And this one, you know, you kind of got to think about a little bit. All right, verse 17, it says, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, all right? So it's coming from verse 16 where he says, and he causes, he's basically saying from verse 14, Verse 13, verse 14, verse 15, verse 16, he's saying, and he does this, and he does this, and he does this. If you look at these verses, if you look at verse 15, where it says, and he, he has this image, he, and he put this image there and demanded that people worship it, basically. And then, and, then we go into the mark of the beast. And then he says, and that no man might buy or sell. You could read that as, no man might be able to legally buy or sell, meaning it's illegal at that point, all right? It doesn't necessarily say that you literally can't do it. It's just saying, you could read that as like, I'm not going to, he's, this government, this system that he has is not going to allow it, it's not going to be legal in this, this antichrist government. It's hard to believe to me that there would be any government that had such control that there's not going to be even some kind of black market or underground something, you know, going on, all right? It's hard to believe that, you know, look, we know that people won't take the mark, right? We know that saved people won't take the mark, but to say that, you know, he's going to be able to just completely control people to, to the point where there wouldn't even be a black market amongst the saved is, you know, a little bit hard to believe. You know, it's, it, could, it could be that it's just, it's illegal under his system to buy or sell, all right? We know that saved people won't take the mark. If you want to look at that, go to Revelation chapter uh, 14, I believe it's verse number nine. You say, well, how do we know that saved people won't take the mark? Well, the Bible basically tells, you know, and then a lot of people are like, they play semantics with this, and they're like, oh, but what if a saved person takes the mark? Will they lose their salvation? Well, just follow me for a second. You know, so look at what Revelation chapter 14 and verse number 9 says. First of all, remember, Revelation is cut into two parts, chapter 1 through 11, and then it repeats chapters 12 through 22. All right, so the rapture is actually in Revelation twice. We just get kind of a, a different view of things. At the end of chapter 6, we see the rapture, and then in Revelation chapter 14, we also um, see the rapture in verse number 14 and verse number 15. But beside that, look at verse number 9 and verse number 10 of Revelation chapter 14. The Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand. So there's an emphasis on the worshiping of the beast, first of all. All right? Is any saved person going to worship Satan? Think about that for a second. 
There's an emphasis on worshiping this image. That's where the mark of the beast came from, is so you know the, the Antichrist could control people that didn't worship the image that he set up in Revelation chapter 13. Look at the verse number 10. It says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. All right, so basically what the Bible is saying here is that people that worship the image and take the mark, which are, you know, one and the same, are, are going to suffer the wrath of God. Well, guess what? The saved people aren't going to be here for the wrath of God. The saved people, people will be raptured, and then the wrath of God starts right after the rapture. So we know that that's not the case. Now look at verse number um, six, uh, go to chapter 16 and look at verse number 2. So the rapture happens, I'll just read it for you in verse 14 of Revelation 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice and saying that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. This is the, the rapture, Jesus coming back and rapturing the saints. Now in, verse, in chapter 16, the rapture's already done. Okay, in chapter 16, the rapture's over. Saved people, gone. We're out of here. All right, now God's pouring out his wrath. Look at verse 2 of chapter 16 in the book of Revelation. It says, and the first went and poured out his vial. These are the, the wrath of God coming out in these vials upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men, which what? Which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. So there can't be any saved people there because they're gone. You know, they're already gone. They're already raptured. They're already in heaven. All right. So it's not that, you know, if you take the mark of the beast, you know, and, and worship, which implies you also worship the image, that you're going to lose your salvation. It's that no saved person would do that. No saved person is going to do that. You know, no saved person is going to worship Satan. It's just not going to happen. I mean, do you have to, like, guard yourself from worshiping Satan as a saved person tonight? I mean, nobody has to do that, all right? You're obviously saved because you trusted on Jesus, you believe on Jesus. You're not going to go worship Satan. It's just very simple, all right? So don't get caught up in those kind of twisted, um, weird, you know, those are those, are those uh, silly questions that people ask that don't really understand um, the Bible, all right? So what to do? What to do? It's possible that, you know, we won't be completely, that's why I kind of put it as a clue, all right? I put the cashless society as a clue that as we see banks and governments moving towards globalism and moving away from cash towards digital currencies, this is a clue. We should watch. We should pay attention to this. I don't necessarily think that it has to get to a point where it's completely cashless because of the fact that you can control people through other means other than just digitally controlling their bank accounts. You can literally just have men and soldiers and armies control populations. All right, it happens today. It's literally happening as I speak this sermon right now. And then second of all, I don't believe that Revelation chapter 13 says that there won't be an underground, you know, buying and selling by believers during that, you know, short time of that tribulation. I believe that you know, there will always be an underground of buying and selling. I believe it will just be illegal. I believe that it will be something that's, you know, they're trying to catch, they're trying to, you know, get you for um, and kill you for. All right, so what do we do? We just watch. We watch for things moving in this direction. That's the whole point of clues and milestones. You know, so and that actually could lead you to a smart savings plan, too. <laughs> you think about, you know, where should I put my savings and where should I put, you know, my, my money that I save and things like that. You know, you can put them in, in real, tangible things that can't be manipulated and controlled. If you want to learn something and actually apply it to your life from what's going to happen in the end times, I mean, no matter what happens to currencies, look, currencies rise and falls with nations. That's always the way it's going to be. That's always the way it is. You know, in 2 Kings chapter 4, I was re reminded when I was reading about this, um, studying for this sermon. Second Kings chapter 4, Elisha comes upon this widow. She was a widow of the servants of the prophets. Her husband had died, and she was worried. She didn't know what she was going to do. You know, she only had one pot of oil. She only had one pot of oil. And oil was this tangible, it was the only tangible asset that this woman owned. And it was something that, you know, if she would have had more of, she could have sold and paid off these debts. She was worried she was going to have to put her children um, into servitude, to pay off these debts. 
And Elisha comes and he does this great miracle for her. He says, hey, go borrow all these pots from everybody and all these vessels from all your neighbors. And she goes and she borrows all these vessels and all these pots. And then he does this miracle where she just pours out her, her, um, her pot of oil into all these vessels until they're full and her pot never gets empty. It's kind of like an Old Testament version of feeding the 4,000 or feeding the 5,000 that Jesus did. And then he tells her, he says, hey, go take this oil. He's like, now what am I going to do with all this oil? Am I just going to bake bread till I'm blue in the face? But it was the, the reason he did it was because that oil was a tangible thing of value. It was a tangible thing of value. And he says, now go sell the oil and pay your debt. So she went and she took all the oil into town. because Everybody needs oil. Everybody needs oil. Everybody's cooking bread. Everybody needed it. So it had all this value. She went and she sold it all, and she paid off her debts. So, I mean, just think about that. Don't waste your money on Cheetos and, and uh, you know, and things that have no value, you know, and that aren't going to have any value. You know, people are always going to, you know, need a place to live. You know, those are where you want to put your money, you know, into, into tangible assets. People are always going to need supplies and food and things like this. You know, just things to, to think about when we read about these things in the Bible. We read that there's going to be this guy that just tries to control your ability to buy and sell. If I couldn't buy and sell, what would I need? You know, think about that. What, what do my, what, well, I have a, I have a child that, that needs this type of medication every two weeks. Well, maybe have some of that on hand. You know, I'm not talking, look, I'm not, I'm not for digging a bunker and hiding in it. I'm just saying, think Smart. Use the knowledge of the Bible to put into action in your life and become a wise person. That's all. That's all I'm saying. All right? So look, I told you I'm not going to keep you long tonight. Let's just talk about the, the series so far and how all these things kind of tie together. Remember the first um, sermon in the series? We talked about globalism. Globalism, another thing in Revelation chapter 13. The only thing I want you to remember about globalism, globalism is not mentioned in the Bible. I just want you to remember the path from Daniel chapter 9 to Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 13. There is going to be a man that comes on the scene that makes a covenant with many nations. He, makes, he gets some allies together. He gets some kind of alliance together. And through war, through the, uh, through the, the horsemen of Revelation chapter 6, he takes that covenant of many and turns it into a global alliance of control over all. All right, so that's the main purpose of the first sermon. The second sermon, we talked about the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation. We're not going to miss this. All right, when some leader comes on the scene, look, there's lots of alliances. That was a clue. Globalism is a clue. All right, there's lots of alliances. There are lots of wicked Antichrist world leaders. You could say all kinds of world leaders were Antichrist. Actually, as a matter of fact, very few world leaders are Christ-like, I would say. But you could say, but we're talking about the Antichrist. How are we going to know him? Because he's going to come into the temple. He's going to declare himself God. He's going to set up an image. And he's going to demand that people worship him and worship this image. All right? We talked about that. That's a milestone. That's going to be the moment where we're like, that's him right there. I kind of had a, I kind of had a thought that it was probably him for several years, but now I know. And then you're like, oh, by the way, his initials are, and you're like, dee, 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 six, six, six. Got him. <laughs> All right, so that's what we talked about with the abomination of desolation. The, cat, the signs in the earth, we talked about all these different things and how that ties in with globalism. These signs in the earth that are going to happen. The storms are going to get worse. The, the earthquakes, there's going to be great earthquakes. These are going to be things that are used. Look, they're clues. There's earthquakes and storms all the time. But they're going to be used to push, it ties directly to globalism and to this world leader that's going to take total control over everything through war. And then the cashless society is very similar. It is just, it is something, it's a clue that needs to happen, or things definitely need to move in that direction for this control to be, to be feasible. In order to control people buying or selling, you need to have a way to exercise control over people. All right? So just, it's a clue. It's a clue. So look, it, it, it allows the mark of the beast, which we will already know who he is at that point. But the good news is that a lot of control needs to be gained when we think about that. When we think about where we are today versus what needs to happen to gain this type of control, 
a lot of control needs to be gained. A lot, look, a lot of control needs to be relinquished or taken away. You could think about it that way um, before these things can be realized, both on the national levels. We talked about nationalists, and we, are, we can already see those clues too. We see the nationalist countries just being demonized. You know, if you're, if you're a nationalist in the United States, you know, if you're, some, if you're a person in the United States now, and you're just like, you know what, I just think that, you know, maybe the United States should worry about the United States, and maybe we should stop, like, invading everybody and just killing all these people who don't need to be killed and selling all these arms and all this, to just keep all these wars going and all this. They're like, Nazi. They're like, what are you, a white supremacist? And you're just like, what are you talking about? You know, but it just shows you that it's, it's this globalist agenda to demonize anybody who would stop this direction that things are moving. All right, so look, we're going to know this stuff. We already see it happening. If you know what the Bible says, and you know the timelines of the Bible, and you know these clues and these milestones, you're going to recognize these things. We can already recognize them today. It's kind of, I mean, there's a lot of wicked, evil things happening, but it's kind of neat to see the Bible kind of, I mean, I mean, God's Word. It's coming true right in front of our eyes. It's really cool. All right? So look, a lot of control needs to be gained at the individual level too. And that's where the cashless society comes in, that economic control. They need to control every single person and their ability to buy or sell. All right? So part of the reasons for this is just to just get you to, to see these timelines in, in the end times prophecy. It's, it seems complicated when you read it, but when you just hear the timelines, it's not that complicated. You know, this way when people say, oh, there's a blood moon and Jesus is coming tomorrow, you can just be like, what are you talking about? What do you, you, it doesn't even make any sense. Think about the timelines, the things that need to happen, things that haven't happened. You know, we see these events. And you know what? We can be, we can be prepared. We can be watching. So we won't be offended when things happen. We can be pre as prepared as we can possibly can be, I guess. And, you know, we can not rush to conclusions about things that are outside the timelines and outside um, the words of the Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.